If you like what you're hearing on the phillytech.org netcast network, please consider supporting the network with a small monthly donation via patreon.com slash phillytechorg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash p-h-i-l-l-y-t-e-c-h-o-r-g. And thank you in advance. You're listening to the Social Media Addicts Podcast on the phillytech.org netcast network. Sponsorship provided by Get Flywheel, optimized WordPress hosting at getflywheel.com, wistia.com at w-i-s-t-i-a.com, and Zoho Mail. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a St. Patty's Day edition of the Social Media Addicts Podcast. I'm Seth. That's Howard. Hey. And we're missing Jody yet again. She had a class to go to tonight, so she might be popping pop in momentarily. Um, chicken cacciatore. In honor of St. Patty's Day, chicken cacciatore. I mean, turkey cacciatore. What? I don't know. It's Why not? He wrote something in the show notes, just so people are a little confused by that. So. As confused they should be. Exactly. So, if you'd like to support the show, as always, go to patreon.com. It's p a t r e o n dot com slash Philly Tech Org. All one word. So it's patreon.com slash Philly Tech Org. Our sponsors this week, as always, are Wistia, Flywheel, and Zoho Mail. So, Howard, shall we get started? We shall. Let us get started with. Facebook's fire hose. Yes. Did you know they had a fire hose? I kind of figured that they had a fire hose. Um, interesting that they have they haven't been uh, selling it. They've been kind of keeping it to themselves. But uh, you figure if everyone else is willing to sell their fire hose, why not Facebook? Exactly. And do you think it would be valuable? I think it would be insanely valuable, actually. More than Twitter's, you think? Uh, yes, way more than Twitter's, just from sheer volume of people and the amount of activity. Um, and I would imagine that there's a fair amount of Twitter usage that has that's automated, that's repurposed content from elsewhere. We're on Facebook. Um, I don't want to say that doesn't happen, but I really get the sense that uh, a lot of people that aren't marketers have their primary platform as Facebook, and that the repurposing of Twitter content. Um, Twitter's repurposing a lot more. There's a lot more link sharing on Twitter, where on Facebook it's uh, more conversational. So the kind of data that uh, someone would get through from that fire hose uh, marketing data is, it isn't just, hey, look at my stuff, or here's a conversation about a particular hashtag. It's very, very deep conversations across many, many people um, that are very easy to track because it's all linked, where some Twitter data it isn't as uh, trackable. You'll get some stuff that's sort of out there. No, what concerns me about this is that, I mean, I like on Twitter where it's predominantly public. I mean, I know my Facebook is predominantly private. Like, I don't let a lot of public posts go out on Facebook. So I'm wondering, like, how much of the fire hose is actually out there? I mean, keep in mind, a lot of people don't know how to lock down their Facebook. So there's probably a few billion. There's probably at least a billion out there that don't lock down their Facebook. Well, but and the interesting thing billion is, to do. yeah, I think the interesting thing that they're doing here with their firehose is actual users are anonymized. So it's it's kind of um, they are aggregating things together. So Facebook is kind of massaging its firehose to basically respect our privacy, but. If respecting our privacy is saying somebody in the South Jersey region or someone in the Pennsylvania region did something like this that's related to the data that you're looking for, then sure, that's what they're doing. If what you don't want to know is that I exist, then you know, get off Facebook. Facebook says very clearly, this is our data that you get to make for us. Um, so it's kind of scary, it's, but it's kind of true. Well, it, it's a little bit scary, but again, if fa- if Facebook charged us for using its network, a nominal fee, and that fee said, we don't include your data in marketing. I think that's a fair trade. Now, there are many people who would say, I don't want to pay a buck or $10 or whatever it is for that, uh, for use of the platform. 
Except then you're, then you're the product. Then you're the product. So somewhere Facebook needs to support its infrastructure. So we're the product. So this is a pretty obvious way of them saying, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're not gonna just depend on our own advertising platforms. We're gonna let other people, you know, create a uh, deeper analysis uh, for that and make a partner and, you know, do the things that Twitter does and other uh, search-related companies do. Now, do you have a problem with being the product? I'm, I, I'm kind of on the fence. I mean, with Twitter, I know I'm the product. I mean, with Facebook, I know I'm the product. So I don't really have an issue with it, per se. But do you? Um, my feeling is this. I'm under no um, false pretense that I'm not the product. So when I put data on Facebook, when I share things and do stuff, I know full well what it, that it can be used for things that I didn't intend it. And I don't feel like it hurts me. Like, I don't feel like I put something on Facebook and now they're going to exploit it in a way that I'm upset about. If there was something that I didn't want them to potentially exploit, I don't think I would put it there. I know full well the agreement that I entered into. I think where there's backlash is people not understanding the agreement that they entered into, not understanding that platforms like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Google Plus and Pinterest are... We are the product. We are signing up to be their product. And that's, you know, if you get it, if you're okay with it, then there it is. Mm -hmm. Let them go for it. Speaking about that, you know, there's 92 million products that are expats. <laughs> yeah. And um, Facebook wants to help advertisers target the 92 million expats who are using Facebook. I mean, I didn't know, there's that, I mean, I didn't know that they really... I define people as expats. Like, aren't you just a Facebook user? Like, well, that, like, you are, I mean, I know an expat is like an American living in Spain. Yes. Yeah, I get what an expat is, but it's like, I guess unless you identify yourself as an expat, you're not an expat. You know what I mean? Well, let's make... When I first saw the number and I said, okay, 92 million expatriates, and I was like, well, you know, considering the size of Facebook... This hardly seems like a massive audience no, to design small. a product around. Except it's a third the size of LinkedIn's active users. <laughs> so now when you put it in that in that size, the fact that LinkedIn has ad segments says this ad segment of Facebook's, this expat ad segment, clearly matters. It's clearly a big enough ad segment. I mean, Think about it this way. Any social network that launched, if within a year they had 92 million people, they'd be jumping huge. for joy. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know what? This is all part of Facebook making their ad platform more valuable and more specific um, so that if you have someone who says, hey, we want to market to people who are, you know, they miss their home country. They're living abroad and they miss America. So what stuff should we show them? That's a, you know what? Mm -hmm. It's a unique ad segment, they're able to do it, so, you know, run with it. Now, if we were talking about 92,000 people, then I would say, yeah, well, I think that's, that's kind of dumb. You know, 92,000 people is barely a blip on Facebook's radar. It's measurable, but it's not enough that I would, you know, do a whole lot of custom coding or custom targeting. Um, but clearly, there's a market of, uh, you know, products and services that want to get to this audience. Otherwise, Facebook wouldn't have, you know, developed the product. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think that, I mean, if I'm living in Italy, I might want to hear about advertising that's going on in America. Like, oh, I remember that. Oh, that's what I missed. Okay. Oh, I want to get that, you know. Be yeah, I, it's, part of being, it's part of feeling connected with the community. And as an expatriate, you know, that is one of the things that happens. You lose some of that connection. You're not with it anymore. Um, and that's something where, hey, if that's what they want to do, they want to feel with it, like I'm cool, um, as they would, as uh, uh, Doctor Evil would go. Um, if that's how they want to, if that's appropriate and makes them feel part of the culture, then why not? Why not show them the ads as well? It's very cool. So get this: this is kind of meta, but Instagram now is now getting more brand posts than Facebook. It's well, kind of it's. Because yeah, it's kind Facebook. of like I'll take I'll, I'm going to stop paying the right hand and I'm going to pay the left hand because they're both owned by Facebook. So when people are like, "Oh, I don't like Facebook," I'm going to go 
over here on Instagram. It's part of Facebook yeah, strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bizarre in my opinion. Yeah. Oh yeah. But um, good, for, I, good for Instagram. It's great for Instagram, and Instagram is a different experience. It's a different product. Uh, we had a story last week that talked about those new Instagram cards where Have you, you wouldn't be able yet? to click to a link. Hmm? Have you seen one of them yet? I haven't seen one in the wild yet. No, I've, I've, been, I've been looking for. I'm actually <laughs> looking forward to seeing it. I want to see. Okay. It. I want to click around. Well, but again, if if what Facebook is realizing is that people are engaging with the ads on Instagram, and they're going and saying, you know what, I'm going to not spend my money with Facebook. I'm going to go over and spend it with Instagram. You're still Facebook's Facebook. happy to take their check, no matter how they spend it. So, yeah. you know, and if they and the other thing I hope happens is that Facebook learns what's good about the Instagram ad product and brings it back into Facebook and starts saying, look, we need to create ad units that kind of learn from each other. You know, what works on Facebook doesn't work on Instagram. They're two different uh, landscapes. So, you know, whatever they can learn from either one, I think is a good thing. Um, but uh, you know what? You know, you, I've been pretty consistent about this. I like it when these social networks experiment with their ad products and, yes. you know, I want them to be innovative with it because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to, like, I like going on Instagram and scrolling through and looking at photos and posting a comment and maybe liking something. So if the ad feels weird, I'm going to skip it. But if the ad feels good and it's relevant to the kinds of things that I follow, and that's great. I'm all for it, you know. they got to support themselves somehow. Absolutely, and this is how we support ourselves with our first sponsor, Wistia. We have, we have sponsors. So, so we love Wistia. We do love Wistia. And Wistia has been sponsoring the show for quite a while. They are a, a video hosting and analytics platform, and it is a, designed to help businesses get the most out of their online video. Video, excuse me, Wistia. Wistia is what we use at phillytech.org. It's much more professional than YouTube, and we get much better data to help us understand how our videos are being uh, viewed and consumed. The other thing is Wistia has a ton of great resources on their site to help people getting started with video. Um, free tutorials, uh, lighting, editing, choosing the right microphone, all of these things and a good community around that just to help people improve. The other thing that I should make sure to let you know is they have a free version of their service that lets you hold 50 videos. So go check them out. Uh, their main website is Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A dot com. It's a great product, but what I want you to do right now is I want you to either go to the link in the show notes, this way Wistia knows that we sent you, or go to phillytech.org and go to the sponsors page and click on Wistia. So again, great people there, and Wistia is a fabulous platform for video hosting and analytics. Absolutely. Moving right watch, along. Let's watch them dance a little bit real fast. There, there we go. Oh, they're going to dance. They're going to dance. There you go. All right, good. Enough of that. Enough of that. Onward and upward. So now this is iOS and Android are both getting Cortana. Cortana? Cortana. Cortana, Cortana which is part of Microsoft's cross-platform strategy. It's like their Siri that's going to now run on iOS and Android. Now, the thing is, is that Google Now runs on iOS. It's not native to iOS. It can't touch everything iOS. Right. So to me, that's not that weird for iOS to be getting another Siri-like person on the on your handsets because you already have Google Now on there as well. But for Android to get a Microsoft, or it's almost like Android getting Siri, it's just weird to me. Yeah, it is weird, but you know this is part of the brave new Microsoft because I'm proud of them. Uh, well, I'm really proud of them. And the, here's the funny thing: <laughs> back a long time ago, I used to have Microsoft certifications. I was a very Microsoft person, knew their products inside and out, very big supporter, and I wasn't a Mac person at all. I wasn't an Apple fan. I grew up with Macs, or actually, I grew up with Apple twos and Apple th and. And Apple III. Um, I grew up with that original product. When the Macintosh came out, that was too expensive and we were a PC household. So I was always a Microsoft fan. That was just the products that we used. And they were very closed. Now, it didn't seem closed because everybody had it, but it was really like Microsoft has its stuff. They do it their way. 
So for Sachin and Adela to come in and really say, look, we are a software company and a services company. And, you know, take the stress off of it has to be Windows. They're recognizing, mm -hmm. look, people are going to use services from everywhere. So why and should we lock... Happening. Yeah. Right, so why should we lock Cortana, which every, everybody looks at and says, this is really great. This is a better product than Siri. This is a better product than Google Now. Why should we lock it to this one platform where currently in mobile, they don't, they're losing. I mean, if you look at Microsoft stats in the they're mobile, they're, 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 they're an also ran. Um, barely. And it's a nice product, too, but it's just an It's also a great ran. product. I actually got a chance to try out a, a Windows phone and play with it and work with it, and I loved it. I was like, if I wasn't in the iOS camp so deeply, I would probably go to this before I would go to Android. Very <gasps> clean product. Yes, really. I know. It's it's like, you know, blasphemy. No, but, but I, would, um, I would go to Microsoft before we go to Apple, too. So. Well, but again, if you think about it this way, that that's a great platform. So what's holding them back? And I think what's holding them back is they are so closed that the only way to really make their products work is to be 100% in their universe until Satya Nadella walks in and says, no one's going to be 100% in that universe. I'm not 100% in Apple's universe. I use Google Apps. I'm not 100% in Google's universe. I use iOS and I use a Mac and I have virtual machines and a window. Like, I, I would. The funny thing is I said, I, I said to my daughter, I said, I kind of want to get a Chromebook just so that I can be... Like, I can have a Windows machine, a Chromebook, and an Apple machine. I like being in Why all those... Why not? You get everything places. else, Howard. <laughs> it's a pixel. It, well, you know, I would probably want to get the cheap Chromebook just as a, as a play machine and to let the kids play with. The pixels, if I had the money for the pixel, I'd probably buy a new MacBook Pro. Um, yeah, it is that's a nice kind machine, of, though. It, you know, it's a beautiful machine. But, um, a 32 again, app spec ratio is a little weird. But anyhow, onward back to... <laughs> But again, Microsoft being much more open and saying, look, Cortana's a great product. Let's let's see it everywhere. It's not going to have the deep ties that into iOS. Um, it will probably have the ties with Android because it can. Where iOS, it's a, there are things that they just won't be able to do. Because um, Android but I'm excited is... to see how they do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to it. I'll download it. I, you know, I barely use Google now, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't find any need for it. I have, I have two phones, and I use them. Great. I mean, do you use Siri at all? I do from time to time. Um, the voice input's really good. Um, I tend to ask it questions. Like, if uh, I, I will say my example is, if I'm in a meeting, I actually find I'd rather ask the phone a question than type the question in. So this way people recognize that, like, I'm asking the phone a question as a resource, and I didn't just start looking at my phone and ignoring them. So it's actually a really positive way that they can hear what I'm asking and see the result. Um, so I do use it uh, quite a bit. Um, I use it to set reminders and to, you know, set a timer. Like, you know, if I put something in the microwave and I'm going to go back to my office, I'll say, like, set a timer for five minutes, and it just sets it. Um, it's pretty easy to do. I find that that's faster than scrolling through and setting the little five-minute timer. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see what Cortana can do, because if it's better than Siri, I'm all for it. Bye-bye, Siri. Please don't go. Please yeah. don't go. So is that, have you played with Meerkat at all? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, my take on Meerkat, it's it's really, really interesting because Meerkat is getting the traditional South by Southwest explosion treatment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it got very, very popular and it just was, you know, blowing up everywhere. Um it's it's almost like a solution in search of a problem to me. We've mm -hmm. been doing live streaming for a long time. So we're doing it right now. We're doing it right now. So from a live streaming standpoint, this is a really closed way to do it. So it has to be through the phone. Um, it's something where I if I wanted to do a really well produced live stream, this isn't the the tool I would use. This is a, hey, I'm just going to start live streaming, and now we're streaming and it's ready to go. So I can't really, um, if people aren't that... following on Twitter, I can't really get them to all assemble. So I have to actually be on Meerkat for quite a long time before the audience all shows up because of the nature of how it goes out. Um, it's true. It doesn't get saved, though, which is nice. It's just a once and, once and done. Well, it's both nice 
and not nice because what if you have a really great event on Meerkat and you want to let people, you know, feel like they were there and incent them to follow you by see, realizing that, hey, these Meerkat casts are quite good and they should pay attention. You Can don't you have the budget that Meerkat would need to store all these Meerkats? Well, again, it's the kind of thing where it would be nice if it was a really clean option, which mm -hmm. is different than, I believe, Periscope, which is what Twitter just bought, um, which will relate to our next story about Meerkat. Yes. Um, but uh, when I think about this sort of hot new single-tasker app that does live streaming, like right now we're going to start live streaming so that everybody can tune in, it, it's something that we could do with Quick or we could do... With um, Hangouts. With Hangouts. So it's not a problem that we had. And again, it's getting a lot of press... And they'll say things, like, think about it this way. The journal recently reported that Meerkat has more than 120,000 users. And then we Ooh. think back to our previous story about Facebook, that they created an audience out of 92 million expatriates. Mm -hmm. 92 so, million versus 1,000. Yeah. Right, so it's the kind of thing where if you take away... Three, if you take away a factor of a thousand from what Facebook did with expatriates, you're about the size of what Meerkat is. Mm -hmm. So should brands be considering it, which is kind of the thing? I think if brands hadn't been thinking about live streaming and how they could integrate live streaming with what they're doing, then Meerkat's probably something they could totally skip. Um, that said, is live streaming important? Yes. I just think Meerkat's kind of one of the latest... Um, Flavors. It's the flavor of something that we've had, and it's doing it in a very special way. Not necessarily a good way, but a special way. It's a hack. Um, it, it's, you know... It's a hack together. It is, yeah. It's an Israeli team that, saw the, that I think saw that Twitter was buying Periscope. Like, let's beat them to the punch. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right and on that. You know, and it's like, for Twitter to buy a, a, an app like this, let's say they bought Meerkat. Makes sense. Add another feature to your toolkit. Great. All right, I get that. But to build out a functionality, Twitter has made it perfectly clear they don't want you building something that they're going to build, which is pretty much anything at this point. So, so yeah. pretty much just don't build on Twitter. I mean, or don't build your full backbone on Twitter, and you know, you know, you you don't own your data. We were talked about this last week as well. Well, you know, make sure you own your content. Yeah. So, don't just put it all around media. Well, and sort of getting moving on to that next story about how Twitter, basically within the, the course of a day, they announced that they were buying Periscope, and within that day, mm -hmm. shut off Meerkat's access to their social graph. Mm -hmm. That's something where um, I kind of want to call foul, because if you give access to a company to a particular, you know, to its social graph, if they say, yes, you can use this, it would have been nice if they had said, you have 30 days to switch over not just to break the app. Um, because, you know, just from the standpoint of getting an app, a change to the app approved through the App Store, you can't do it within the span of a day. So yeah, it's, it's a low blow. It, it's kind of a low blow. Um, it kind of reminds me that Twitter built its whole platform by being very, very open and then proceeded to close everything down once it got popular and say, yeah, we're going to kick you out. We don't have to, we don't need your help anymore. Um, thanks, thanks for the help. Bye-bye. Right, exact, exactly. Hey, you guys were great. You made us all popular, so you can leave now. Exactly. And it's so, like, it's Ryan. I'm taking my toys and going home. Exactly. Well, on that note, let's thank our second sponsor, Flywheel. We have another sponsor. Flywheel is managed WordPress hosting, and it is built for designers and agencies. The idea is this. WordPress isn't... Uh, it's not rocket science, but it is WordPress, which means there are specific security things you want to do, um, specific things to optimize the memory, to make things load faster, to cache things, to back things up. All of those things that you want out of WordPress, Flywheel makes it really simple for you to manage those WordPress sites, and their support is WordPress knowledgeable. So what that means is when you're having a problem with whatever WordPress project that you're building, Instead of having your hosting company say, "Well, we don't know what you're doing. You need to fix it, and this is ha here's the you know here's the docs to fix it yourself," 
um, but all we know is you're breaking things. Flywheel actually has support people who are WordPress developers. They know how to make things work so that you can ask them questions. Hey, I'm having a problem doing this in WordPress. How can, you know, what can I do? They actually know. So they help designers all the time. Um, and they have a very good product uh, for WordPress uh, websites. Um, so please go visit uh, Flywheel and go to our sponsor page and click on the Flywheel link from there to make sure that they know that we sent you. Absolutely. We love you, Flywheel. We run on your... We actually run Flytech.org on your servers, so thank you. And I host all my clients' stuff on Flywheel. They're incredible, so... Yeah. So this next story, Bitly. Remember Bitly? I remember Bitly. I mean, you probably still use Bitly. <laughs> you know what? Bitly... Here's the thing, okay, and I'll, it's, I'll do... It's I'm going to go off on a little on Bitly opinion. rant. Okay, so... If I click on a link and I don't know where it's going to go, I could presumably be clicking on a link that takes me to a malware site, um, a Rick Roll video. Like, I don't know where that link is going to take me. I just know that it's a shortened link. Now, the original purpose of a shortened link was you only had so many characters on Twitter. It seems like one of those things where a, a link shortening service... I don't want to say it's gone by the wayside, but the very nature of link shortening has every... It makes every security-related bone in my body hate it. So I've yeah, never been a huge branding. fan of link shortening. Um, the advantage of it is you make your... Instead of having these really super long links, you have nice short little links that are short. That's the advantage. Um, and no, theoretically, you can, you can more, get some you can more it. of a summary around it. You know, I mean, I, I build URL shortness for all my clients, and I'll make it so that it's like, you know, I have one that's s 3 thme Right. Just the three being Seth. Yep. The three being the E in Seth. And so I, mean, I use that, and I put all my all my links through that, so it's branded for me. They go to the set s 3 thme it takes you to do something that I built. You know, and it's still a short URL. My problem with Bitly is that they're not short anymore. Right. Everyone and their grandmother uses them, and they're like seven or eight characters long exactly. after Bitly. So they're not, it's not a short URL anymore. So I mean, they have some good analytics, but I would much rather roll my own, you know, being using while you using URLs while you are yep. ls, and and building building one myself, and then you start off with you know the domain slash one. Yep. I mean, slash two. And you can it's make them really a short URL. Yeah, you can really make them short. I actually, um, I do, I have my own URL, URL, or URLs, or URLs. URLs, URLs. URLs uh, products set up myself for that very reason. I don't I really want to be using bit.ly links. Um, because most I of these. Them. I can't believe I have too many. I have too many. I can't get rid of any of these domain names because they all have URLs attached to them. Exactly. The, um, the interesting thing about what Bitly is doing, by adding more effectively, they're calling them deep links to help yes. marketers so that they can have you know more integration with mobile, so that their links aren't just web links; they actually will work with mobile as well. Which is really um, neat. I think it's really neat, but again, it's that what's built into this little thing I'm about to click, mm. and it's secret sauce. It involves, hey, we'll launch your app store. Well. I didn't realize I was going to have my App Store launch when I clicked this link. It just looked like a link. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of that, like, all the things that I don't like about Bitly is built into this, except what they're doing I think is very cool if I can get over the... It makes me crazy not knowing what's going to happen when I click on something. Absolutely. So it's, you know, this is sort of the uh, pros and cons kind of argument. You know, pro... It helps integrate with mobile. Con, you could be watching Rick Astley videos all day long. Actually, there was one recently. I was speaking of Rick Astley. I think it was saying that there's more snow coming. You get hit by that one, and you went there, and it recrawled you. I think I saw something like that. Yeah. I clicked on it. I fell for it. I clicked on it. I was like, oh, I exactly. recrawled. And I started whistling the song the whole day. So next story is Twitter. Plus, weather data equals better customer insights. So Twitter and IBM are now teaming up to do a study to... Uh, they're doing a um, 
IBM is, sorry, let me get this right. IBM just announced a new cloud-based service for analyzing Twitter. So the, the big blue is working with Twitter to look at the unstructured data and to, to predict weather events. That's pretty neat. What do you think, Howard? I think that's very, very neat. It's actually something where, um, kind of like that Facebook story we talked about earlier, where they're working with, um, uh, what's the name of that company that's, uh, oh, yeah. What was the name of that company? Um, right. Jumping back, jumping back over to that story. Um, the fact that they're working with Data Sift, again, yes. that's sort of the, the IBM's now competing with that, saying, "Hey, we're going to work with Twitter because we compete with Data Sift," mm. and you know, this is sort of the big data product. So, if IBM partners with Twitter and Facebook's partnering with Data Sift, then you know, obviously, they're going after how do we take all kinds of data and kind of look at it one combined with the next to learn something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the examples the article talks about is how um, during nasty weather, during bad weather, the angry mm -hmm. tweets, cable companies or wireless customers cancel their subscriptions because they're mad because, hey, you know, we had a service problem because of the weather, so I our service doesn't work. We're very angry. So, so I'm going to cancel my account. So I'm going to cancel my account because it, the other provider must work fine during the bad weather. I and look at it this way. It, yeah. If you call up customer service and they already know, hey, we're having bad weather, we recognize that you might be upset, we're already on the job, you know, you don't have to wait on hold because we're already dispatching. To, like, they could, just by being a little bit more responsive, if that can reduce their overall churn by 5%, well, in my world, 5% is not worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But in the telco world, it definitely is. So is. working with that kind of big data, I think, would be uh, pretty great. Um, same thing, you know, the other examples of retail and fashion and stuff like that. Interesting stuff. Very much so. Speaking about small data and <laughs> using your email, um, let's thank our last sponsor, Zoho Mail. Um, where did Zoho Mail go? Oh, there. I just scrolled. Well, I want to thank phillytech.org wants to thank and Seth and all of us here. We want to thank our sponsor Zoho. Was that English? <laughs> it was all English. Um, Zoho Mail is professional email. It is designed for business, business class features, business class security, but contains the convenience of the web and mobile. Very, very simple. Zoho Mail is it's a great platform. Um, I'd actually at some point really love to dive into all the other products that Zoho offers for businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, mail is just one thing that they do, and they do a great job of it. Um, but Zoho offers a free, ad-free account. This is something that most other free mail services, it's all ad-supported, where what Zoho does is it says, for up to 10 users, you can use it for free. And that free, ad-free account can be signed up for by clicking on the link in our show notes or, again, going to phillytech.org slash sponsors and clicking on the Zoho Mail link there. Yes, I did a very bad job of being Van away. I actually went to my email. <laughs> it's late, guys. I apologize. So anyhow, here's the end. Before our picks of the week, last story, um, Lincoln just acquired HR startup CareerFI, which I thought was kind of interesting because LinkedIn is used by many, including yours truly, for career searches. And I think this is one more thing to help, you know, automate the referral process using big data. Sorry, just pull that line out. <laughs> you hear it, Howard? I'm here. Any comment on this? Um, I kind of feel like this is more of a defensive move for LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn kind of wants to dominate this space. So the moment they see other smaller companies doing something good, I think they're in the position that says, we want to make sure that we just own this space outright, that we really don't have a lot of competitors. So to me, buying this startup, yes, it will be good to integrate it, but my guess is that we never hear from these people again. They go, they go into the abyss. They go into the abyss of tech startups. And you know what? If this tech startup just made a nice living by creating a potential competitor, to LinkedIn and LinkedIn said, here is money, go away, or we're buying you so that you can not bother us. I'm okay with that. 
I just I look at this service and it's something that LinkedIn can already do. So Absolutely. I really feel like all that it's doing is saying, well, if you can't beat them, buy them. Like just they might be doing something special, so let's learn from it. Maybe we'll, maybe it's a um, an aqua hire. Maybe it's one of those things where there's some really talented engineers there doing stuff, having good ideas. Bring them onto the LinkedIn team and let them innovate for LinkedIn as opposed to in the startup world. So, you know, I, I kind of feel like that's what this is for. But we'll know. Maybe it turns into a whole careerify section on LinkedIn. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, didn't they buy a pulse? Um, I think they bought Pulse. Yes, they, yes not, they bought Pulse. They bought Pulse, and that's a whole big thing that they do now. And Pulse is part of LinkedIn, but it's its own, its own brand as well. Exactly. So you never so. know, because I mean, right now you have LinkedIn being the social network, Careerify be the the HR slash job searching area, and then you have Pulse being the news and this this you know that stuff. So so anyhow, let's move on to the picks of the week. A friend of mine is is a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He's also a social media guy, and he published a big, fat book. <laughs> I was surprised when I got it in the mail. He sent it to me. Um, yes, this is a review copy. Nice. So I did not pay for this, so I will be giving this away as one lucky reader, listener, once I finish reading it. Um, you can hold me to it, Howard. Maybe I'll send it to you next, and then you can read it. And you can give it away. <laughs> But it's called Tweets and Consequences, 60 Social Media Disasters in Politics and How You Can Avert a Career-Ending Mistake. So, of course, the first story in here is Wiener. Really? I can't yes. imagine. What could Anthony Wiener have done? Exactly. Multiple times. <laughs> One of the chapter 55, Holy Pope, Batman. <laughs> I mean, there's it's very comical. I mean, the thing I like about it is that he says, you know, what was done... The response to the, the the incident, and then from there, what is the lesson to be learned from this? And some of them are like, "Don't take pictures of your dick." <laughs> like, it's, that, it's it's that blatant. I think we just yeah, have to, well, I think we just have to explicit tag. I think regardless of social media, it's never a good idea to take pictures of your private parts. Exactly. You put a little bit more more gently than I did. But yeah, the lessons from tweets that were sent to the wrong account. Yeah. Mm. So it's an interesting book. I'm going to get through it eventually. Now, we can put a review up on um, the Rants and Rambles show. It's on hiatus. I'll make a, a, a ramble about this. Um, well, I like how they have the, they have the um, almost the madman guy falling out of the sky going into yep. the, the ocean of... Um, of the sharks. Of the sharks, exactly. So yeah, check it you out. You don't have to send it to me because I already bought it for my Kindle, so... You just bought it just now? I had already bought it before. I saw that link and I look and I looked at it and said that looks fabulous. I want to get that. So I already, uh, it's already on the. It's well, I don't know if it's on the Kindle yet because I haven't no, it's opened on the my Kindle. Kindle, yet. It's on the Kindle. But yeah, when it's, it's on the when I open my Kindle, I expect it to appear there magically because that is what the Kindle does. And honestly, as much as I don't want to offend my friend, it's a perfect toilet book because it's, the chapters are short. <laughs> it's perfect. I love it. Yes. <laughs> But it's perfect. I mean, it's, you, you have a good month worth of toilet reading here, and it's quality. Or, or it could be two months, depending on how regular you are. Exactly. <laughs> on that note. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for sending it to me. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, he's going to love me for that. Absolutely. So, Drobo. I I, love Drobo. You know what? I have you two have picks Drobo? this week. I have two Drobos. I have one at my home and one at my office. Oh, I'm so jealous. Of course you have a Drobo. Well, I I will say the two Drobos that I have are quite old. I have very they they've been lasting a long time. They're great products. Um, my Drobo at home when I came home from my little weekend away was flashing with a big old red X on one of the drives, and I went, uh -oh. "Oh crap!" Because what Drobo does is it allows you to effectively throw in whatever number of hard drives, whatever hard drive sizes, and it sort of joins them all together and provides some redundancy. So if one of the drives fails, you don't lose any data. And the thing that I really, really love about how the Drobo works is you don't have to remember, oh, this Drobo is filled with four two terabyte drives. And if you wanted to upgrade your storage, you would have to upgrade all of your storage all at once. With the Drobo, you just go, oh, well, let me just start putting threes in. So my rule with my Drobo has always been, 
I put drives that are about between $100 to $150 a piece in the unit. Now, that was not how much do they hold, but my budget. So whenever a drive crashes, I know, oh, drive crashed, spent about 100 bucks, put a new drive in. And so the latest, right now, $100 drives are about 3 gigs, I mean, excuse me, 3 terabytes. So I got home... Well, so when I originally got the when I originally got the Drobo, um, my my first Drobo that I got, it originally had a 500 gig, a 300 gig, and a 250 gig drive, and I was like, wow, this is more storage than I can ever use. My that same Drobo that I bought, um, I want to say I bought it like in this one's one of the original models. I think I bought it in 2008 or 2009. Um, it now has a three terabyte, a two terabyte, a two terabyte, and an open space. So that Drobo, just over the years, as a drive crashed, I popped a new one in, or as I needed more space, I popped a new one. I popped a new drive in. My one at home, when it crashed, it's a five bay. So the top one crashed. Everything was flashing. It went, you know, it basically was like, oh crap, I'm restoring stuff. Popped out the bad drive, and after a little while, it had rebalanced all of its data. This afternoon, I popped in the new three terabyte drive. And now that one has a three terabyte, a two terabyte, a one and a half terabyte, and a two terabyte, and an open space. So wow. the combination makes it, it ends up giving me, I think that one gives me about six terabytes of storage total. So it's not add up all the drives and get that much storage. It gives you that redundancy so that any one of those drives can be popped out and you still have your data. I watched it in action. It worked great. I love Drobos. I think they're wonderful. Um, it's a pretty no the they're, not, they're not cheap. Well, the, but see, here's the thing. When you buy the case for the Drobo that doesn't come with any hard drives, the cheapest one that they sell is $300, and that's the 4-bay USB 3.0 uh, unit. Um, I actually have seen them on sale for $200. Um, but in general, think, to, think in your brain, I'm going to have to spend $500 on the case. But this case that I bought in 2008 is still the same case that I'm using today and popping new drives in. So... It is an investment to get started in, except it then has create, uh, amazing longevity. Because most of the other solutions, if you were to go out and say, well, I need four terabytes of reliable storage because I'm doing video editing and that kind of stuff. Look at this right there. Right. Well, the right disadvantage there. with those drives <laughs> is if one of the drives goes on one of the, let's say you buy a four terabyte um, external drive and it's one box and it's that thing. If one of those drives goes, the whole unit goes down. Yeah. So... Now, with my Drobo, I had a drive go. Nothing went down. I didn't lose any data. I kept right, Even though it was rebuilding itself, I could still write new data to it and use it. Um, oh, wow. So it doesn't die when it dies. It's, it's pretty great. Um, the funny thing is, I just, in my Drobo at work, I knew that I was getting low on storage, so I was already going to buy new hard drives. So when my one at home died, I bought hard drives for the one at home and for the one here, and so I just popped in another drive over here. So it's currently rebuilding, and I've been writing video and stuff like that all day long while it's rebuilding its data structure to handle the redundancy. It's pretty great. Um, wow. so and you also, since that, Jody is not here, you have another pick. I have another pick, and this is more of the <laughs> physical world pick. Good. This is Gizwiz version. Yes. Okay. okay, so here's the thing. When people make video and people take pictures, the one thing that they get wrong consistently is skin tones. They don't actually do white balancing the right way. Most digital cameras, most video cameras, have a white balance feature. It allows you to set the white balance right so that people look correct. Well, the problem is that when most people want to set white balance, they don't have anything to set it with. So they let the camera do it automatically. Now, I'm in a room that has fluorescent lights overhead, and I've got a little uh, skin tone light over here. It's, it's a mess from a light standpoint. So the, cam the, the webcam here is just sort of giving me whatever it can give me. But when I'm actually producing a video, I need to use real white balance. So you can get white balance cards, anything from a small, tiny card, like you could use a little index card to get white balance, or you could get something that actually works with how the camera adjusts its exposure and color temperature. So what you really need is a giant gray card. And this gray card is really large. Um, it's about 30 inches. It's got a little focusing target in here so that when you focus your camera on it, it has something to lock on. But what this does is this, when you cover the whole frame, gives you 18%, it gives you 18% gray. And that 18% gray is how the camera calculates exposure. Now, you can also set a custom color balance 
by flipping this over, you love it when I do the tricks like that, and getting yes. white. Because here's what's going to happen. When I put this and dominate the scene, you're going to notice the camera's going to start darkening things to gray. Because the camera's trying to think 18% gray. But it, it's really white. So when I get it over here, you'll see it get whiter, and then it gets darker because the auto exposure on the webcam is making adjustments. Well, you don't have to use auto exposure. You can set your video camera or your DSLR. You can set it to a custom white balance and a custom exposure because the real world doesn't get brighter and darker based on whether I'm wearing a dark sweater or a light sweater. And so the only way to really do that and tell your camera this is real is to have something in the real world that you know is actually 18% gray. So this little doodad, even though it's huge, if you do the trick, and I'll do it on camera, you can actually fold it down really, really small. And I didn't do a great job of that, but it goes into a little tiny bag so that you can store it and whatever. It pops open. I don't want to get hit by it. There we go. Pops open. Um, great little device. They make them in all sizes, flavors, colors. Um, I have a bunch of things like this that I use depending on the situation. But what I found is when you're trying to set a video camera the right way, the video camera wants to see it full screen. So if you're trying to get a, white, a custom white balance for video, your subject is going to hold it in front of them. And that's going to completely fill the frame. So like right now, if I want to fill the frame, that fills the frame and I don't have to move the camera around. There it is. You got it. So, yes. wow. Gray card. You can get them at most camera stores. Um, B and H Photo is where I got this one. Um, I spend a lot of money at B and H Photo for all the video production stuff that I do uh, and digital photography stuff that I do. So, great little card. Um, I think it was fifty bucks for that one, but you can get them for like twenty-five bucks for smaller ones, ones that are more like twelve inches um, squares, things like that. Great product. If you're making any videos, at some point you're going to say, why aren't my skin tones right? Why is white balance wrong? And the answer is, you need one of these. Mm -hmm. So, that's Where my is B&H? Is B&H in New York a 212 number? Um, B&H is in New York. Um, it's in Manhattan, I think. Yes, it is actually near the Javits Center. Exactly, exactly. That's what I thought. So Adorama, which is another competitor to B&H, Adorama is technically in New Jersey. So, but they have a store in they they have two they have a store in New York near B&H and another one in New Jersey. So the disadvantage for me in Adorama is I get charged sales tax when I order from Adorama. So oh, sometimes because I'm in New Jersey, so I have to pay, I have to pay that. But uh. the shipping for both of them, you can pay for the cheapest shipping. And it gets there next day. So if I order it by like four in the afternoon, I'll have it. You know, if I ordered something by four today, I'd have it tomorrow by 10 a.m. Even though I'm paying free, or I'm getting free shipping or ground shipping or something like that. Very very That's fast. Great. And if you're and if you're in Brazil, um, BH has a Brazil website. Really? Yes, and I can't get out of it now. Oh. <laughs> I'm stuck in Brazil. I clicked on Brazil, and it's like, uh, now yeah. you have to clear your cookies out of that one. No, 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 there's a button. You found yeah, it? it? There's a, yeah, apparently the Brazilian. Who knew? Who knew? Cool. Well, that's been the show. For the, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Hopefully yes, you're happy not St. Watching. Patrick's Day. We have one viewer watching us right now. Hello, viewer. Hey. <laughs> and on that note, it's been great, and we'll see you next week, hopefully with Jody. All right. Take care, everyone. See you later.